Good morning, everybody. Uh, our first case today, we've got a 69-year-old uh, retired deputy sheriff uh, with a history of follicular um, carcinoma of the thyroid. And this gentleman was referred by his ENT for new throat and neck pain, which was radiating to his jaw and upper left chest. Uh, and this pain was uh, brought on by strenuous exercise, such as jogging, and relieved by rest. Um, he had had a recent upper endoscopy and colonoscopy negative, uh, and he was status post partial thyroidectomy, uh, recent, and he admits to uh, having anxiety. Medications included levothyroxine and lorazepam for anxiety. Uh, admits to a history of um, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, has a considerable family history of um, heart disease and uh, 15 pack years of smoking uh, in, in uh, quit, quit about 20 years ago. Physical exam was unremarkable. Um, so EKG was performed, found to be a normal sinus rhythm, and so we decided to send this gentleman for coronary CTA, and we can look at the images. Hold on for a second. So uh, we're going to change presenters here back and forth. And so the point uh, on this particular patient, if you go back to the first slide, is that uh, he had recurrent episodes of neck pain and went to see an ENT doctor. Well, his neck pain was really an anginal equivalent. The ENT doctor bumped into a thyroid cancer and took it out. The patient continued to have pain. So that was serendipitous discovery of follicular carcinoma by a patient having recurrent angina. Well, he's a deputy sheriff. Deputy sheriffs have a lot of heart disease. Well, how much? Well, uh, if you're a retired police officer, uh, you have a 50% chance of having a heart attack in the first five years of retirement. And so that's not uncommon. So we've got a risk factor, a big risk factor, deputy sheriff. Most people wouldn't say that's a risk factor, but if you do your homework and do your studying, you'll find that deputy sheriff police officer, first responders have much more heart disease than other people. Actually, their life is cut short by about 12 to 15 years because of coronary artery disease, not because of bullets. So let's take a look at uh, this gentleman's CT. See how fast we can pick up on how much coronary disease he has, or if he has any at all. So we can take a look at the volume rendered image, which is a good starting place. Not the usual starting place. People usually start with the Axio image. But if you start with this image, you can see the slices that have been acquired. One, two, three, four, five slices. So you can conclude this is probably a 64 slice scanner since we have five slices. That means that this was done with step and shoot, moving the patient on the table through the gantry. And so there's going to be some artifacts produced by that. So you have to be very aware where these slices come together. There, 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 there. And you have to be able to turn it and turn the entire heart and see where those slices are causing artifacts. There's one coming through here. And so, and then we can pick out the real lesions that are between where the slices come together. So, hey, look, 3D volume rendered, piece of calcium up here. Okay, a little piece of calcium there. All right, looks like the LED is just sort of lumpy bumpy, but I don't see any superior stenosis. Looking at this column of dye coming through the lumen of the vessel and with the wall. But I see a little pinch over here. This is a pinch in the column of dye and a pinch in the wall. And so that looks like a significant lesion. Well, is there a misrepresentation? Registration coming through there? No, nope, there isn't. So that is a significant lesion. So let's go over here and see about the right. Well, here's a misregistration coming through the top here. Here's one coming right there, and you can see where it didn't quite come together. But we've got this area right underneath here where the vessel either has trickled through or is totally occluded. So that represents another lesion. So we can just pick these out so easily just like you pick them out in the cath without a lot of work. Now we can work it a little bit and we'll show you how we work it a little bit and see what we find. So we weren't impressed with the circumflex 
and we weren't impressed with the left hand tier descending. We can bring you over here and restore some of these images and show you the ones that did impress us. And so, diagonal vessel. 53% diameter stenosis, 75% cross-sectional area stenosis, 6.4 millimeter length. Small vessel, not very big, may not be worth any effort in terms of intervention. left hand descending was okay. Let's go look at the right and see what it looked like. We can save all these snapshots and then restore them as a total volume rendered image. So on the right, hmm, severe lesion, maybe totally occluded. I really can't tell. Sometimes the computer will show you trickle through when it's not. Looks like you probably, if it's that size, you can get a wire through. We've got 91% diameter, 94% cross-sectional area. Very interesting. Is there anything else? Well, there's misregistration here, misregistration here. Are there any other lesions? Well, there could be. Don't know. Let's go look at the circumflex. And uh, first I'll show you the right, and I'll show you the convergent divergent double cone that's produced. And there it is. There's our convergent divergent double cone. And I can't see if there's any dye coming through. I really, really can't tell you if this is connected. We were measuring the angles in that. It doesn't look like the angles stay there, but we we're interested in measuring these angles of convergence and divergence. I can show you that we do have some software for establishing this information. And uh, we can look at angles and measure them in different ways to try to understand what's going on here. And we just click along and show you angles here. And we'll be using that in the future to try to understand the convergent divergent double cone and what's happening here with uh, hemodynamics. Let's restore this one and take a look. And so this is the circumflex. And so we did toy with the circumflex a little bit and we can't find a severe lesion. There are little areas of calcification that are up for grabs in terms of whether there's a lesion or not. Calcium is our nemesis. We can't see through calcification. There is a way of doing calcium subtraction now with certain CT images, but we can't do that with ours. So I can't find anything there. Is there anything, in the, anything else in the right? Well, I don't know. I can show you in retrospect that I went back to the right and picked along trying to find a second lesion. There's a 55% diameter stenosis, 70% cross-sectional area stenosis. And you can see there are little stenoses that you can come up with. And that doesn't look so severe, but we've got this one up here anyway to take to the bank because it's almost total occlusion or maybe total occluded. Uh, but this, uh, this may be another lesion. So let's find out what the truth was. Let's look at the uh, cardiac cath. Or maybe that's not the truth. So, hey, we can find the diagonal lesion. There it is. Well, certainly an angioplasty is going to say, that's a small vessel. It looked pretty big on the CT because we can mag everything. That is a really small vessel. I don't think anybody's going to do anything with that. Uh-uh. What's this out here in the circumflex? Well, that's the distal circumflex supplying a posterior lateral. That looks like a severe stenosis. We didn't find a severe stenosis. We found that 55% diameter, 75% cross-sectional area. We didn't find a severe stenosis. So it looks in the eye of the beholder, that looks a lot worse. That's a bigger vessel than this one up here. Yeah, turns out to be a bigger vessel supplying a posterior lateral wall. So we didn't appreciate that one as much, but again, we're not doing FFR. We're looking at, hmm, eyeballing this, 
looks like a bad lesion. So let's go look at some more here. See what else we can tell. We can play it. You want to see motion? We can give you motion. Here comes some motion. Not sure if motion helps. We can slow it down a little bit. Sometimes things pop out that you didn't see before. Oh, here's the right. Right doesn't look as big as it looked when we were looking at it. So it's a shared circulation. Well, there is a severe lesion. Let's stop it. There's our severe lesion right there. There's our total occlusion, or almost total occlusion. Well, we got two. And when we were looking at it, we only saw one. So we saw this one. There's one upstream from it. So we're certainly consistent with this one, and this one we didn't see, but it doesn't matter because we found this one. But if this was the only le lesion up here, would we have missed that? Because we didn't quite define that one as being significant. So there's our correlation, CT, cardiac cath. Let's go to the next case. I'll give you back to Luke. Hang on, please. Hello again. For case two, we've got a 59-year-old white male uh, security analyst, retired military with a um, history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And he came to us for a second opinion uh, on a previous diagnostic left heart cath uh, performed about three months before. Uh, about a year ago, he presented to the VA complaining of chest pain with uh, strenuous exercise, and he had a workup, um, typical uh, EKG, echo, and spec CT, uh, and claims that he was giving uh, nitro but never received any uh, results uh, or follow-up. He continued to have the chest pain um, and was ultimately, in March of this year, referred to a cardiologist uh, by his urologist, and this, based on the previous uh, old positive spec CT led to him having a left heart cath done. Uh, he had no other symptoms other than his um, anginal chest pain. Uh, the presumptive diagnosis at this time was uh, stable chronic angina. Um, he was on Lipitor, aspirin, and omeprazole. Uh, and he did have a family history of coronary artery disease, as well as a history of cigarette smoking. So in this situation, in this case, the cath was actually done before uh, our advanced imaging, and we came up with some uh, interesting results that differed significantly from the cath. And we can show you the cath first, since that's the order of operations here. And so here's the cardiac cath. There's a long main left that may have some narrowing distally. And uh, we can look at vessels. And this, these are not normal vessels. There is some coronary artery disease. But we can start looking for something significant. You're wondering about the origin of the LAD there. I was wondering about that too. They didn't call it significant, and we can lay it out a little better for you. Again, stenosis is in the eye of the beholder. You got to make a quick judgment if you have a catheter in your hand. You got a guy who's got recurrent episodes of chest pain on exertion. He's really getting tired of his chest pain. He's annoyed with the medical system.
So we couldn't identify a severe lesion. And uh, this was dismissed as having lumps and bumps, no severe disease, and uh, plan medical therapy, reassurance, etc. So hang on here and we'll bring you over to the CT scan. So here we are at the CT scan. You can see the misregistration is obvious from heart rate in this patient with this is a slice, this is a slice, two, three, looks like four slices. And we were able to get the anatomy together and there's some heart rate variation creating uh, it doesn't quite fit. And so you have to read around the artifact. So we can look at the left anterior descending, which is highlighted with this green center line. And you can see where we are, where this little tiny dot is, if you can see the dot. And you can see the misregistration right here where my little plus is in the middle. You can see some calcification proximally. You can see that long main left. You can see that kind of funny looking origin of the left anterior descending. Trying to decide is that a severe stenosis proximally or is it not? That's a, that's a tough one to call. Let's take a look at this more graphically and see what we can make out of that. And uh, let's blow this one up a little bit more. We certainly got a nice static look at it and we can change this around a lot but don't forget we've got calcium here and calcium distorts things for cardiac CT and so we could put something like this on here and see if that narrows down and we could bring this down from the main left which is probably like a tubular narrowing in the main left maybe call this normal and bring this up here and uh, try to define this it's hard something like that I can't come up with a severe lesion there and it's somewhat distorted and it looks different when you move it around so having 3D is very helpful here as opposed to flat land in 2D. Well, we've got a little stuff here, but that's a dinky diagonal. We've got some stuff here, not important, little vessel. So let's peek up in here and we can see the circumflex where it's very curvy. And it comes down this way, curves up this way, and comes around this way. So let's open that one up a little bit and see what that tells us. And as we open that up, you can see that there is a stenosis hiding back in here that with three-dimensional imaging, we can bring that out and see it so much better. And so let's take a look at it and see, is this something that was missed on the cardiac cath? And let's take a look here. So there's the misregistrations you've seen and the misregistration has nothing to do with that area. Here's our dot. Here's the misregistration. Here's a misregistration. So it's not a false reading from an artifact. So then let's go down this vessel and see how we can score that and how we can grade it. And so there it is right there. So let's see if we can get this into some longitudinal pictures color code it, make these bigger transverse images, and then come up on this. And there it is. So we've got, actually we've got a plaque that looks like it has a lot of necrotic core. It's a one 25.83 uh, with necrotic core and so uh, and there's a significant narrowing let's see what we get on this narrowing we can give you a, something that's objective there's a convergent divergent double cone and we have to decide what's normal 
let's just call this area normal right here before it starts funneling down. Let's look at these transverse images. And so, hey, this is pretty interesting. We've got, let's move this up a little bit. So we go over here, pick this up, come over here. Let's move it to where it just starts coning down. And let's move this down a little bit. So now we've got an 80% diameter lesion, a 95% cross-sectional area. We've got a necrotic core at the stenosis of 44.8%. You can see that that's encroaching towards the lumen. We can't tell you if it's a thin fibrous cap or not. OCT can tell you that. And then if we take the whole plaque from here to here and measure how much necrotic core there is by volume, we got a 38% of that is necrotic core. And at the plaque site, uh, the greatest stenosis 44.8% is necrotic core, and you can see that. So that's a, that's a big problem. And so here we are able to discover with our cardiac CT a lesion that we couldn't identify before. Let's go back to the cath and see where that was because I do that with the CT. I go back to the CT and look. Let's go back with the cath. I'm going to give you back to uh, the cath and get, make Luke the presenter again. Hang on. Okay, so we're back at the cath again, and we can see the circumflex coming out. And uh, you can see it up here where it's got all this whirly stuff, and it comes towards you and then away from you. Looks like a hard one to be able to get inside. And uh, so we can put a stop on this and stop the image. There we go. And here, so here it is. This is the circuit. This is where it comes around. And I can't see that lesion because of the way the plane it's in. Let's see if we can tell it in another plane. So take a look at this. And we'll put a stop on it again. So I don't see it in this plane either. So somehow in here there's a lesion that's concealed that we just can't seem to find. Maybe it's over here on the, maybe it's this part of the circ. Not that far. Oh, excuse me. I was on the, well, that's, uh, that's not it. It has to be up in here somewhere. So this is very difficult to, to come up with. Let's look at this one and see what it looks like. Uh, that's the right. Hang on. That's the circ. LED going to the apex. Diagonal. LAD going to the apex, circ up here, can't find it. So let's go back over here. The patient was very happy that we were able to identify lesion for him. And uh, he's tired of having chest pain on exertion. And I think uh, this is going to be a target for angioplasty. He's been referred to Dr. Stromquist because he's a veteran, so he's going to go to Bay Pines and uh, probably get a stent in that, and he'll be happy to have that. And so there's a case of, you know, a spec scan. I'm not sure how it helped uh, because of 40% false positive, 65% false negative. Nobody uh, seems to be able to rationalize why we do spec or how to correlate that with the anatomy, and especially with FFR. And so the cardiac cath, which was unrevealing, has some coronary disease spattered around 30% lesions. And then the CTA, we were able to discover a high-grade lesion, and uh, he's going to have angioplasty. So that's our correlation for this case. Let's go on to case three.
criminal case, we've got a 63-year-old white male <clears throat> real estate annual analyst who uh, presents with three weeks of new back pain uh, with radiation to the uh, neck, uh, left greater than right. Uh, the pain is worsened by fast walking or climbing stairs. Uh, he did have a significant trauma to the spine greater than 30 years ago, sustained in a motorcycle accident, and he does have residual uh, pain from this. Uh, but he states that this new pain is uh, different from his baseline. He's had an MRI that showed um, diffuse uh, thoracic spine disc disease, but no obvious impingement to explain uh, any of his current symptoms. Uh, so he was referred to us for coronary CTA. Uh, this patient does have a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, which he claims uh, that he was able to correct through lifestyle modifications. Uh, he had no other symptoms and uh, medications, only gabapentin. Does have a family history of coronary artery, uh, cardiovascular disease and a distant smoking history. Uh, as a result, um, he was started on Plavix, aspirin, Lipitor, and Renexa pending our C, uh, CCTA study and we found some uh, a significant lesion um, as a result, and we can show you those pictures now. So again, to show you an approach, uh, I usually get the volume render image up. I get the 3D image up. This is what makes coronary CTA unique, is to be the ability to have 3D images. Our scanner is a 64 slice scanner. There's going to be some heart rate variability. So we're going to look at the slices. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a low radiation procedure with step and shoot and eye dose where basically the image uh, is acquired for less than three millisieverts. We have a lot of noise in the image and then it's cleaned up with a computer. So we are able to reduce the KV. And so looking at this coronary it, from the outside with the volume rendered image, we can see it's got a few lumps and bumps. We can see where the misregistration is. Looks like it lines up pretty good. Don't see any significant lesions. As we go over here, we can see that the left anterior descending didn't quite line up. So there's a little bit of error there and here, but going up the left anterior descending, it looks great. Proximally looks good. Here's a second diagonal that's small. And then what's outstanding and obvious is this first diagonal vessel, which has a either trickle through or a total occlusion. I can't tell which. And one of the limitations of cardiac CT it's just not as easy to identify late filling collaterals that are collateralizing a vessel and a totally occluded vessel that's filling late. But it's easy to see that it's totally occluded or near totally occluded. So that's very obvious. This vessel may not be very obvious in a cardiac cath because it may fill by collaterals from the circumflex or from the LED late it may turn out to be a ghost vessel. That's not a very big vessel. Let's put it in perspective. There we go. Putting that in perspective in the whole heart doesn't look like much of a vessel. Okay. And so at the ACC a number of years ago there was a presentation uh, that showed that patients with severe diagonal vessel uh, treated one group medically, another group with stenting, show no difference in five-year follow-up. And so, for the most part, we treat lesions like this medically, and we don't stent them. So, let's look over the anatomy one more time. Left anterior descending, and then we've got a second diagonal that's little and skinny, and then we've got a first diagonal that's near totally occluded, or maybe totally occluded, and then we've got the circumflex OM, and then small continuation of the circumflex. And then over here, large right coronary artery, 
that gives a posterior descending and some distal vessel. So that's what we found. Uh, let's continue his story and let's go look at after we put him on aggressive medical management. He on Saturday had another episode of chest pain, was a little scared, went to the emergency room at Tampa General Hospital and of course he's going to get a diagnostic cath even though he's already had a diagnostic CT. And so let's take a look at that. So hold on and I'll give you back to Luke. And here we go with cardiac cath. So looking at our cath, we see again, and we can stop it for appreciation of the images. Here we go. Distal circumflex, OM1. Main left, got this big LAD, small diagonal vessel, even tinier diagonal vessel, and our vessel's missing. So let's play it through again and see what happened to her. Vessel's not here this time. So perhaps it was totally occluded all the time and we couldn't see a collateral. So let's see how it can be appreciated to be filling by collaterals and where it is. And it's so hard to see these ghost vessels sometimes. Let's let it fill late. Yep, it's coming in late. So we're going to stop it in just a minute and let you see where that vessel is coming in late. So it is a total occlusion, probably a chronic total occlusion. And as we go back, we see a ghost vessel over here bifurcating, coming up this way. And if we came up proximally, we would see it filling. You got to keep your foot on the pedal and you got to go back to see where it went. And so we can't really show it to you very well. We didn't go back up, but if you go back up, you would see where it connects. And so we're not sure this was picked up. Could be that uh, the doctor doing the cath may have decided, here it is, the ghost vessel, may have decided that there isn't a lesion and it's a normal cath, which happens sometimes. But we can see, watching in here, the ghost vessel coming back. You need to foot, keep your foot on the pedal a little bit longer to be able to show that. Maybe we'll see it here better. There it is, way up there. So we can stop again and show this to you. It's so hard to see that. It's way up in here. Let's play it some more. That, that's it, right up in there. We can look and see if there's a report on that. Luke, you can be looking for a report. And I'll go back over here and we'll see if they, if they actually found that, actually saw that or not because it doesn't look like there was much attention paid to it. So let's go back over here. Still no report. And there's no report, yeah. And so going back to our original premises, since we're at the wrap-up time now, your choice. And your choice is cardiac cath, CT, which one for you? Healthy, may not be so healthy, You'll have to decide. So let's go over here, and we have Mary, Mary Daniels is here. Hey, Mary. Let's go over here. She's self-muted. Uh, and we'll look over here, and we'll talk about Hobson's Choice. You may not have heard of that, but here's a gentleman by the name of Hobson who lived a long time ago, and he ran a livery stable. And they'd get the horses and they'd saddle them up and have them in line, number one, number two, number three, number four. And in the stable, when you came over to hire a horse for the day, basically uh, you would be given a choice. Your choice is take the first horse. That was always the rule. You never got the choice. You always took the first horse. That was called Hobson's choice. Well, Hobson was kind of a rigid guy. 
And he also had one, two, three daughters. And so he said, and in those days, women really couldn't find good employment. They're working. He has a little store here, too, near the stable. And the women were working there. And he said, I've got to get my girls married off. And so if you're a suitor and you come in and you're reputable, you have a choice. You actually get the first one, the oldest one. Once she gets married, then I can marry off the second one, the next oldest one. And then once she gets married, then I can marry off the third one. So the analogy here is frequently when you go to the hospital, you have a Hobson's choice in that you're on your way to the cath lab if you have chest pain. It seems to be getting a little different. It changes rapidly. But this is where we want to go. And I don't know if you're familiar with Sir Gawain and uh, the lowly lady. But uh, at one point uh, in the legend of King Arthur, there was a black knight riding around holding his head in his hand. And he got in a fight with Sir Gawain and defeated him. And he said, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to give you a choice. And here's the deal. You come back for the answer to my riddle. And if you have the answer in a year, you live. If you don't have the answer, you die by my sword. So he said, here's the riddle. What do all women want? This could be what do all people want, but it's what do all women want was the choice that was given. And so he went off with his life, and apparently he met a lady that's a beautiful lady, but she had uh, a curse of a witch on her. And uh, he loved her, and they got married, but there was one problem, and that was she could be a beautiful lady for 12 hours out of the day, and the other 12 hours she could be a hag, and she would change her visible appearance. And so Sir Gwaine was given a choice. Do you want her to be beautiful during the day and a hag at night so that all of your friends would know you're married to a beautiful lady, but in fact at night there was this lowly lady when she changed her visage? Or do you want to be married to a beautiful lady at night, which then she, you would have all to yourself, but then the public would see her during the daytime when she was an old crippled hag and they would say, that's Sir Gawain's wife. Take the choice. And so that's a very difficult choice for Sir Gawain because of public you know, perceptions as well as selfish motivation. So Sir Gawain, being a wise knight at this point in his life, decided to give it to her. And he said, you choose. Well, of course, she chose to be beautiful all the time, and the spell was lifted. So then he went back a year later to the Black Knight. And the Black Knight said, I'll kill you if you don't answer the riddle correctly. What do all women want? And the answer was, in those days, sovereignty are to be able to make their own choice. So what do all people want? The ability to make their own choice. What choice would you make? And I can tell you, a lot of people not given a choice had the cardiac cath because of a false positive spec scan and would have liked to have had a choice. People now who are Google familiar, who navigate the system, are getting a lot wiser. And so we had the gentleman who is a big uh, financier in the HCA company was given the choice. And he went out and shopped around. He was given no choice, the cardiac cath, the Hobson's choice went around, shopped around, came up with the CTA, and had the CTA. What have I had? Of course I've had the CTA, you know? And what have more of the doctor, all the doctors here at Memorial Hospital have had the CTA? And so although, although they may send their patients to cath, they've all had the CTA. And so that's where we end today, and uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you next week.